Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom McNulty, and I'm here with our presenter, Aya Takase. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for attending Ragaku's webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Materials and Life Science. This is our sixth segment, Geology Applications. It will focus on the principles and techniques researchers use to develop optimized methods for geological applications. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Please note, if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can view them on the Regaku website. When today's presentation ends, you'll automatically be directed to a Regaku webpage containing the links for the previous five webinars. Now, as far as today goes, as usual, we will be accepting questions during the live webcast. We ask that you submit your questions via the Q&A button on your screen. We'll be saving all your questions submitted during the webcast, and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note, we'll not be monitoring the raised hand or chat features. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. Okay, that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Aya Takase. Welcome, Aya. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the webinar series, X-ray Computed Tomography for Materials and Life Science. Today, we will talk about geological applications. So I am an X-ray physicist, not a geologist, but geology is something we can define as a science that deals with the history of the Earth and its life, especially as recorded in rocks. Well, according to Merriam-Webster. You can use rocks to study the history of the Earth because they are very good at preserving information. For example, strata preserve a lot of information about Earth's history. Another good example is fossils. And although those are man-made, carved stones can preserve information for a long time. And the information that we're trying to extract from those stones or rocks is often visual, such as shapes or distribution of a certain phase. So imaging analysis is an important part of the study of those rocks. Either you're trying to learn something about the history of the earth or maybe certain properties of the rocks as a potential resource. And today we're gonna take a look at how we can do this how we can extract visual information from rocks using X-ray CT. So in this webinar, you will learn some keys to imaging rocks and analysis techniques that are useful for rocks. And we will take a look at a number of geology application examples. Now, when we scan rocks, what should we consider? What we need to consider here is not that different from what we have been discussing in the previous webinars. So we wanna think about the resolution and the field of view. We also wanna think about the contrast. Now, let's talk about the resolution and the field of view first. I'm putting those two parameters in the same category because they are related to each other. And we talked about them a little bit in the first episode of the series, but let's do a little bit of recap. So, when you have a small field of view, you can use a small voxel size. That means that you can use high resolution. But if the field of view is large, then the voxel becomes large. This means that you have to compromise on resolution. In other words, you're looking at two different choices, either high resolution in a small field of view or low resolution in large field of view or something in between. And those two sets of settings have their own pros and cons. If you use high resolution in small field of view settings, then you can reveal a lot of details, but your sampling size would be limited. If you use low resolution, large field of view settings, then now you have a large sampling size, but the details might be lost. When you look at this table, you might wonder, why not always use a high resolution? Well, there are a couple of reasons why we can't quite do this. Generally speaking, 
The voxel size is somewhere between one three thousandth and one thousandth of the field of view. And this limitation is coming from how many pixels you have on the detector. And that's a hard limit. The other reason why this relationship is limited is the file size. So we did this calculation before, but let's take a look at it again. Let's say that the field of view is 100 millimeter cube, and we decide to do a pretty good resolution scan with one micron voxel size. Then you would end up having an image file that is two petabytes or 2,000 terabytes in size. And this is just too big to deal with. You don't have enough space to save the scan and let alone analyze it. So to keep the file size under control, you always have to balance the field of view and the voxel size. Now, good balance can depend on multiple factors. For example, you have to think about how many samples you have to scan for a certain project and how big those samples are. You might have to pay attention to how much disk space you have left. And always, you have to think about how much time you have. And always, I'm thinking you should run a test scan before you commit to 20 or 30 hours of scans so that you can get an idea of what kind of resolution and a field of view you're going to need to do the quantitative analysis you're trying to do at the end of the day. Now, depending on the situation and all those parameters, there are times that you have to compromise on resolution. And when you do so, it's important to know what happens if the resolution is too low. I'm going to show you two examples where the resolution matters quite a bit. So this is a CT scan of packed beach sand. And the cross section looks like this. You can scan this sample at, for example, 25.2 micron voxel size. This is not great resolution, but, and it looks a little bit pixelated, but you can see the grains no problem. And if you're trying to calculate the packing density or maybe the void volume percentage, then this image should give you a decent result. Now, you can scan the same sample at a little bit higher resolution, 9.4 microns. It might take a little bit longer and the file could be a little bit bigger, but you get a better looking image. Now, what if we want to analyze the grain size? In that case, you have to segment the grains and also separate the individual grains. So let's take a look at the high resolution image. So let's zoom into those two grains and you see some dark pixels between those two grains. And those dark pixels will help you to separate those two grains when you do watershed segmentation. And you can recognize them as two separate grains. Now, let's take a look at the lower resolution image. We're gonna zoom into the same two grains and we still have those dark pixels, but we don't have too many anymore because this is not a high resolution scan. And when you do not have enough number of dark pixels, the watershed segmentation might fail and you end up having one big grain instead of two. Now let's step back and look at the entire cross sections. And those are the results of the grain separation or object separation. At a glance, they might look okay. You see all different colors, meaning that those grains are separated and indexed separately. But if you look at it closely, you realize that this low resolution image, those four grains painted in one color, meaning that they were recognized as one big grain. When you look at the high resolution image, they are nicely separated. In the same manner, those three are connected, but those are separated. So as you can see in this example, when you're trying to separate individual grains or pores or void spaces, the resolution becomes more important. So that's one example. Let me show you another one. So this one is a drill core of shale and the cross section in the center looks like this. Let's zoom into this image. Then you see a crack going through it. And this is a 9.1 micron voxel size image. It's high resolution enough to see this crack. So you can measure the width or the length of the crack. 
Now, if you lower the resolution, let's say 10 times to 91 microns, then the same image would look like this. So this is obviously too low of a resolution and you can't really see the crack anymore. So if you're trying to image very thin or narrow cracks or fractures, then it's important to use high enough resolution. So that is that for the resolution in the field of view. Now let's take a look at the contrast. Those two images are typical CT cross sections of carbonate and sandstone. When you look at those images, you realize that we have very good contrast. There is very strong contrast between the void space and the solid part. And you can even see different gray levels coming from different minerals. You can get high contrast images like those because most of the minerals you see in rocks have distinctively different densities. So density contrast is usually not a problem then what can be a problem? Well, there are two major contrast-related artifacts we have to pay attention to. One is the beam hardening that can cause shading, and the other one is the partial volume effect. I'm gonna explain what they are and how to deal with them. So let's start with beam hardening. So we talked about beam hardening a little bit before, but we're gonna just Think about the case where you have a cylinder-shaped mineral sample. This is a very typical shape of a sample if you're looking at drill cores. And for this exercise, let's assume that this cylinder-shaped sample has only one phase. It has very uniform density inside. Then if you look at a cross-section here, it should look like this. And it would look like this if you use monochromatic radiation, but in reality, when we scan this sample in just regular laboratory, you would have to use polychromatic radiation, meaning that you would be using a tungsten target-based X-ray source and you apply high energy, so that high voltage so that you can get a high energy X-rays. In that case, you have polychromatic radiation with a range of energies and that causes beam hardening and you end up having a cross section that looks like this. And this is called the cupping artifact or shading artifact. And this is a typical artifact you would get when you're looking at a cylinder shaped mineral or rock sample. Now, before we talked about what to do with this, let me just briefly explain why this happens. So we have this cylinder shaped rock sample and we're gonna put a polychromatic radiation with a little bit of X-ray energy range. And when they go into the sample and come out of it, then you're gonna have a little bit different energy distribution like this. Now it makes sense that the X-ray intensity goes down because a lot of X-ray photons get absorbed by the sample. But at the same time, the energy peak position shifts towards the higher side. So now you have a higher energy distribution, and this is where the name beam hardening comes from, because the higher the X-ray energy is, the harder the X-ray is. Now let's take a look at the sample from the top. And imagine that we have the cone beam geometry. Then at the center of the sample, the X-ray photons need to travel a relatively long distance. At the edge, they have to travel a little bit shorter distance. Now, the longer distance X-ray photons need to travel in dense material, the harder they become. So you have a very hard X-rays at the center. And the hard X-rays will see lower absorption rate, even though they're looking at the same material. Now, towards the edge, just relatively speaking, you have softer X-rays, which see higher absorption rate on the same material. Now we have different absorption rates, although we're looking at the uniform density material. And this difference causes this shading. So high absorption rate means higher density, so it appears that you have a higher density material towards the edge. Low absorption rate means lower density, so it seems that you have a lower density at the center. So this is where the shading is coming from. Now, the important question is, what should we do about this? 
And there are a couple of things that we can do. We can always do some sort of a correction. You can try a numerical correction or apply some sort of image correction. You can even try to do physical correction, meaning that you can create a piece of rock that's shaped like this to compensate the distance difference. But however you try to do this correction, without knowing what this material exactly is or what kind of density distribution we have inside of this core, there's always a risk of doing undercorrection or overcorrection. Now, let's take a moment and ask ourselves this question. What is our goal here? Our goal is not to do a perfect correction of the shading artifact. Usually, our goal is to do clean image segmentation so that you can extract some quantitative analysis results. In other words, if you can do clean segmentation, you don't need to worry about correcting the shading artifact. I'm going to show you an example. So this is a cross section of sandstone. And there is a tiny bit of a shading artifact, but it's not very pronounced. And if you're trying to calculate, for example, packing density, all you have to do is to set a threshold to segment this into void and solid. And if this works, the simple thresholding works, then you don't need to worry about correcting the shading artifact. So if histogram thresholding works, you don't need to worry about correcting anything. But there are cases that the shading artifact can be very severe and the simple thresholding doesn't work. In that case, you can try histographic segmentation. And I'm going to explain what this is in a second. And if even that doesn't work, you can use machine learning or deep learning segmentation that usually does not require any correction. You can use the raw data and do clean segmentation. Now, let's take a look at an example. So this is a carbonate core, and inside there are a lot of voids. Let's take a look at a one cross section. So this sample is showing a classic shading artifact. You see brighter color towards the edge and darker color towards the center, although this is just one material. Um, I believe this is calcite. If you look at a profile here, you see this sagging of the baseline. So this is a classic shading artifact. Now let's try simple thresholding. If you set one thresholding, your segmentation of the solid part would look like this. Let's zoom in a little bit. So you're setting, for example, the threshold so that those voids are not painted red. But at the same time, you have a problem towards the center where you see all those gray holes. They are not painted red, although they should be. You can adjust the threshold so that those holes go away like this. And now it looks pretty clean here but now you lost those voids, they're all painted red. And this happens because there is no one happy threshold that can work across the cross section. The correct threshold actually depends on the distance from the center of the core. This is where the histographic segmentation comes in handy. In histographic segmentation, you can combine two images to do the segmentation work. So for example, you can use the original image and combine this with a distance map. The distance map is using the gray level to represent the distance from the center of the core. Now we're gonna make two dimensional histogram using those two images and it would look like this. So the brighter color represents higher number of voxels and this axis is the original gray level from the original image. And this axis is the gray level coming from this distance map. Now let's take a look at the center of the distance map here. At the center of the distance map, it's pretty dark. And that means that we are looking at those pixels or voxels. Now we're gonna jump back to the original image and look at the center and set a threshold that works just for that center area. We don't need to worry about the shading at this point. We're just looking at the center area. And then we set a threshold like this. 
Now we're going to go back to the distance map and look at the edge area, which is bright. Now we're looking at voxels in this area. And we're going to jump back to the original image again and set another threshold that works just for that edge area. In the same manner, you can set a threshold for different locations of the original image. And at the end, you will have those voxels selected and you can map this back to the original image. So this is where we started with just one simple threshold, which was not working very well. But if you use the histographic segmentation by combining the original and distance map, you can get a segmentation that is this clean. So let's zoom in. So we had a problem with this one, but the histographic segmentation looks a lot better. We don't have holes towards the center and we still have those voids towards the edge intact. So you can see that the histographic segmentation can be very effective when you have a severe shading artifact. Now there are cases where the histographic segmentation doesn't work and the image might be more complicated or you might not have good contrast. In that case, you can always use machine learning or deep learning based segmentation. Now, again, we're doing this segmentation because we have some sort of quantitative analysis we want to do. Let's say that we're trying to do void percentage calculation in this case. So the first step is to segment the solid part. Then we assume that the rest of it is the voids and calculate the void percentage. And if you use three different ways to do the segmentation, you're going to get three different numbers as the quantitative analysis results. Now, the thresholding method, we know that is not working. The result was not looking very good. So it's grossly overestimating the void percentage. But the histographic and deep learning segmentation results look pretty close. Now, they're close, but they're not exactly the same. So another thing to note here is if you're trying to compare multiple samples, it's important to keep the sample size about the same and use the same scanning conditions and use the same segmentation technique. If you change the segmentation technique from sample to sample, then you wouldn't know what difference you're looking at. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, when I explain those different methods for segmentation, one of the very common questions I get is this one. So which one is the best method? The answer is, as always, it depends. It depends on the sample and it depends on what kind of quantitative analysis you wanna do. But this is a good question and I'm gonna attempt to answer this in a general sense. So, the histograph, uh, histogram thresholding based segmentation or histographic segmentation, both of them can work pretty well if you have a binary system with a high contrast. When I say a binary system, I mean that you have only two phases in the system. Now, if you have more than two phases, three, four, five phases, or you don't have a good contrast, then I think machine learning or deep learning based segmentation would work a lot better. Now, why does the number of phases matter? Why is there a difference between binary and three and more phases? Well, the answer to that question relates to the next topic, the partial volume effect. So let's take a look at an example to understand what this is. This is a cross section of a piece of rock that it has five different phases. You might remember this one from the second episode about data analysis. We used this one as an example. So this image has pretty distinct five uh, gray levels. You can even see five peaks in the histogram. So you can simply set thresholds to segment this image like this. But what if we use machine learning, random forest, for example, to tackle the same task? then you're gonna get a result that looks like this. So this is a lot cleaner segmentation. Let's compare them side by side. When you do the histogram threshold based on the segmentation, you get decent result, but you see a lot of kind of noise-like speckles 
And another thing you see is weird framing of different faces. I'm going to show you uh, zoom up. So in the threshold-based segmentation result, you see those red and green lines or frames around the yellow face. You don't see the same problem uh, in the machine learning result. So those frames are not real. This is actually an artifact. And this artifact happens because of the partial volume effect. Now, to understand what's going on, I'm going to use this kind of simplified cartoon version of two phases. So we're looking at an interface of two phases. I'm going to just call them black phase and white phase. And when you image this interface, you're going to use a finite size of voxels like this. And let's take a look at the center voxel. So this voxel is not going to give you a combination of a black and a white phases. This voxel is going to give you just one gray level number, which is an average. And in the same manner, all other voxels will give you all different shades of gray. Now, after observing this image with a limited size of voxel, you end up having the white face, the black face, and this kind of artifact gray face. And this is what we call the partial volume effect. Now, let's go back to the original image. So in this example, you can see at least four distinct gray levels. And let's zoom into the interface between phases one and four. So this is an interface of phases one and four. There's nothing in between, but there are intermediate gray level pixels in between because of the partial volume effect. If you're trying to segment this image into just two phases, one and four, then you wouldn't have a problem because those gray pixels will be labeled either as one or four. But in this case, we have phase three and phase two that are kind of in between gray. And that's why those phases two and three will show up in the interface as this artificial frames. And that's how you get those frames. You don't get the same problem with the machine learning. It might be easier to see here. So you see the red phase kind of framing the green phase. Again, you don't have the same problem with the machine learning. And other than this um, kind of framing artifact, you also can get rid of those noise-like speckles. You don't have those in the machine learning segmentation. So this is why when you have a more than two phases, you probably can get cleaner segmentation by using either machine learning or deep learning. Okay, now we just covered two Typical artifacts we need to be careful about when we're looking at rocks. And everything we just talked about is based on pixel segmentation. Now, what if we care about the shape? Not necessarily the volume percentage of each phase, but we care about the phase, the shape. Now, let's take a look at this as an example. We want to know the shape of this inclusion not necessarily the size or the percentage, but we want to know the shape of this inclusion. Then you can always segment this inclusion like this using all those pixels. But if you use those pixels, you end up having this kind of shaggy looking interface, line or surface. This is probably a better representation of the shape of this inclusion. And you can get this interface line or surface either by using interface detection technique called ISO 50, or you start with the pixel-based segmentation, but convert that region of interest into a surface mesh. But either way, you don't want to stay with this pixel-based segmentation if you want to analyze the shape. You want to convert it into a surface mesh like this. And this is a better representation of the shape of this inclusion, and you can see the difference even more clearly in 3D. Okay, so we discussed how to balance the resolution in the field of view. We also talked about a couple of contrast-related artifacts to be careful about. But always think about what analysis you want to do, what quantitative analysis you're trying to do, because 
depending on what you're trying to analyze, the best balance for the resolution and the field of view can change and also the best strategy for the segmentation can change. Okay, now let's take a look at some examples. So what can we do with a CT for geological samples? There are many things we can do. For example, you can look up pore structures, you can look up cracks and fractures, you can do phase texture analysis or you can quantify the phases, you can look at the grain size, you can also study formation process or weathering process. And the last two items are a little bit different, but if you have meteorites or fossils that are precious and you don't want to destroy them, then X-ray CT is a non-destructive imaging technique that can be very useful if you're trying to image meteorites or fossils. Now let's take a look at an example of a fossil. So this is a CT cross-section of an ammonite fossil. And what we are looking at here actually is not the original shell of the ammonite that was preserved. Most of the things, the gray things we're looking at here are just the minerals that fill the inside and outside of the ammonite shell. And what's left behind is the imprint of the original ammonite shell. Now, what we can do with this image is to segment the imprint of the ammonite. And once you do this, you can kind of reconstruct in 3D what the original ammonite shell looked like. You can cut it in half virtually. And then when you cut this in half, again, you see all those minerals filling the inside of the shell. But after the segmentation, you can remove the minerals and isolate the shell. You can convert the shell into a surface mesh. And at this point, this is just a polygon mesh. So you can export the result as an SDL file and you can analyze the dimensional uh, parameters, or you can even use that SDL file to make a 3D printed version of this fossil. So that's that for a fossil. And can we quantify voids in rocks? And yes, and this is probably one of the easiest analysis you can do with X-ray CT. So let's take a look at this example. So this is a sandstone core and there are a lot of void spaces inside. If you look at one cross section, you can see a little bit of a shading artifact. In this case, the center is a little bit darker, but what we are interested in here is just the void percentage. So we don't need to worry about it too much and just do simple thresholding to separate the void space and you can calculate the percentage as 22.9. This sandstone is Idaho gray, which is pretty porous. Now we can take a couple of other sandstones and analyze them using the same segmentation technique and compare the results. So this is crab orchard and this one is a lot denser and the void percentage is only nine. This one is liver rock. Liver rock is a little bit similar to crab orchard, but it has a little bit higher void percentage of 9.7. Again, if this is an easy analysis that you can do. You can, in many cases, you can just use a simple thresholding to compare the void percentage. Now, what about different phases? So this is a CT scan of a carbonate core. And in the cross section, you clearly see different phases. Again, you will segment those phases like this, then calculate the volume percentage in 3D. The high density phase, this one, is a 17.4%. And the main phase, I believe this is dolomite, and it is 80.6%. And the rest of it is 2% boys. So this is a phase analysis. What about grain size? So to analyze grain size, you have to segment the grains then you have to separate the individual grains. And once you do that, you would have results looking like those. So in this case, you see all different colors uh, indicating grains. And once you get to this point, you can investigate anything about those grains, maybe grain size, grain shape, aspect ratio, or location. 
And this is an example of a grain size distribution. So they are now color coded for their size. Blue is a small and green is a medium and red grains are relatively large. You can plot the results in histogram. And from this graph, you can see that the most of the grains are small, five to six times 10 to the seventh cubic micron. But there are a couple of red grains and the red grains are almost 10 times larger than the average. So this is a grain size analysis. Now, can we see cracks? Yes, this is something else you can see with X-ray CT. So this is a piece of rock and there are some cracks going through this piece of rock. The cracks are actually easier to see in the cross section. And you can segment the cracks like this, then you can visualize where the cracks are running in 3D, and you can also measure the width of the crack. So in this graph, yellow represents pretty wide uh, cracks over 700 microns, and the dark purple and the blue areas are more like a 50, 100 microns. The next topic is a poor network. So can we analyze a poor network? And yes, and this is one of the, uh, I believe, very common analysis that people do with the rocks. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So we're gonna use this packed sand as an example. This is just a raw CT scan image. The first step of a poor network analysis is to segment the void space like this. So this is the segmented void space. And then once you segment this void space, you can start calculating different things. For example, you can look at the distance map. And the distance map show you where the center location is between two grains and you can trace them. Or you can measure the thickness of the void space to identify large void space, like this one is over 200 microns, or narrow spaces, Maybe this one is 30 to 50 microns. Now, this is just a tiny patch uh, we are looking at in 2D, but you can visualize this in 3D for an entire core and remove the grains to see the void space color coded for the size. Now, this void space can be seen as a port network. So let's say that this is a part of the void space. Now, we're going to say that those large spaces are pores, and we can measure the size of the pores. And those pores are connected with those narrow throats, and you can measure the throat size too. And then when you look at the void space this way, you can start looking at this as a pore network. And analyze things like path length. So this image is showing the path length between different pores. The blue chains represent a relatively short distance between two pores. Green is a little bit longer, and this one is over 500 microns to go from one pore to another. And again, you can always look at the entire pore network in the cylinder without the grains. So this is a regular path length. You can also calculate the direct distance between two pores as a straight line. And at this point, we have two different kinds of distance measurement for two pores. One is the round around way to go through the void space, and the other one is the straight line. Now, we can calculate the ratio between those two and get tortuosity. And tortuosity can be mapped to the original image like this. So in this image, blue chains now represent relatively straight path between two pores, low tortuosity. This red one is high tortuosity. That means that you have to go kind of long round away to go from one pore to another. Another way to look at the pore network is to visualize the connectivity. So in this case, uh, you're looking at how many pores are connected to each pore. This one, for example, is a dead end. So this pore is connected to just one another pore. This one is connected to three more, and this one is connected to six pores. Now, I wanna take a moment on here and tell you what software tool I'm using to do all those analysis. 
I'm using Dragonfly 2020, and I used this to do all the segmentation and quantitative analysis and the poor network analysis you just saw. Now, if you're relatively new to you know, CT image analysis, the process to learn how to do all those things and how to learn um, how to use the software you pick, or maybe you're still trying to pick the right software to do all this. And this whole process can be a little bit overwhelming. There are many different ways to do segmentation and image processing to choose from. Now, if you feel this way, a little bit overwhelmed, uh, I have a good resource I wanna share with you. So Dragonfly is software product made by Object Research Systems. And Mike Marsh, a scientist from Object Research Systems, did a series of webinars to teach people how to do those analysis. And I think he did a great job breaking down this gigantic software program into digestible bite sizes. And each session on is, I think, 20, 30 minutes, and it covers essentially just one topic. So by watching his webinar series on with Dragonfly you can play with, I think you can pretty painlessly learn how to do all those analysis. So I highly recommend his webinar series. Another resource I wanted to share with you is OpenPNM. OpenPNM is an open source you can use to do poor network analysis and various simulations, including permeability calculation. And OpenPNM was developed by a group at the University of Waterloo, and it is an open source, so anyone can use it. But if you do use it, uh, please make sure to reference the original paper by Gostick. I'm gonna show you just one example that was calculated using OpenPNM. So yet another way to visualize poor network is to show the equivalent diameter spheres with sticks that are connecting those pores. Now to get this network, I use the OpenPNM for calculation, but OpenPNM works as a plugin in Dragonfly. So I'm still using Dragonfly for the visualization. Now, people do poor network analysis often because they are planning to put some sort of liquid or fluid into the voids or pore space. Now, can we see that fluid in pores or voids? And yes, this is another thing you can do with X-ray CT. And I'm gonna show you two examples. So this is a CT cross section of packed sand and I'm using this colorful lookup table in this case instead of the grayscale because the gray level difference between the oil we're gonna pour over uh, into this container and the void space, which is air, is rather subtle. And it's a little bit difficult to see the difference in grayscale. That's why I'm using this colorful lookup table, but I am not doing any segmentation in this case. So you're looking at the raw data. So, we're going to put some oil into this container from the top and the first 15 minutes, nothing really changed, but in 15 minutes, you see the oil coming into the void space. It's about third way in and in 20 minutes, it goes two thirds and in 25 minutes, it goes to the bottom. Let me show you this again. So this is a dry state and this is 15 minutes. 20 minutes and 25 minutes. Now we saw the process of oil going into the void space. And in this case, to see the change of where oil is on in this container or the packed sand, each scan was done in four minutes. So this is a sort of 4D uh, imaging. Now, now we have the oil pretty much replacing the air in the void space. Now you might be interested in putting another kind of fluid, maybe brine, to push the oil out of the system. And then when you do that, now you have two different kinds of fluid. And this is uh, such an example. So you have packed sand and you have oil and you have brine that is uh, trying to push the oil out of the system. Now for this image, the difference between oil, brine and air 
is really, really small. It's a very subtle difference. So I used deep learning segmentation to segment the oil and brine out of uh, sand and also remaining air. And they're colored after the segmentation. So blue is brine and yellow is oil. And those dark spots that are still left, those are air bubbles trapped in the void space. So as you can see in this example, you can even have two different kinds of fluids in the void space and you still can see them and you can also see any uh, air bubbles that are remaining in the system. Okay, so we just looked at a number of uh, geology application examples and I would like to mention the useful resources, again, so that you didn't have a chance to take notes. So I highly recommend Mike Marsh's Dragonfly webinar series. You can just type in your browser, orss.ca slash YTP2, and that should take you to the YouTube playlist. Another resource I wanted to share with you is OpenPNM. Again, this one is just one word, openpnm.org, and that should take you to the OpenPNM website. Okay, so we just looked at all different kinds of analysis techniques today. And I wanna mention that most of those techniques were really not feasible 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. And it's been almost 100 years since Radon proved that X-ray CT can work in concept. And a lot of progress was made since then, including the invention of commercial CT scanners. But I think one of the most significant progress was made in the last five years. The, all the AI-based image segmentation algorithms such as machine learning or deep learning, and those techniques became available only recently. And the computers were not really fast enough to deal with gigabyte size images before, but now they are getting there. So I think now is a really good time to take a fresh look at what X-ray CT can do. And if you're new to X-ray CT, I hope that you saw something interesting today and you will start thinking about using X-ray CT for your research. Okay, so you just learned some keys to imaging rocks and analysis techniques that can be useful for rocks. And we also took a look at geology application examples. As always, all images were collected on the Rigaku CT scanners. And to learn more about them, please go to rigaku.com and contact. Now, this is the sixth episode of the series. If you missed the previous webinars, you can go to this URL or just search for Rigaku webinar or Rigaku CT webinar to go to our website to watch the recordings. So this is it for this episode. Now, next on X-ray computed tomography is gonna to be about life science applications. My colleague, Angela Criswell, will be presenting techniques and examples in life science. This one is going to be on October 14th, Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Saving Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Now, before we go to the Q&A session, I have one more announcement to make. We will be holding the Rigaku Virtual Analytical X-ray Convention from August 4th to 6th. This is a virtual event and we will be broadcasting educational presentations and live instrument demonstrations for X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescent analysis, and X-ray CD. You can go to rigaku.com slash convention to see the full program and register for the event. If you have been wondering how we collect all those CT images you saw here, you can maybe join us and watch us run samples live. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Tom. Okay, thanks, Aya. Very interesting. And thanks again for presenting. And certainly we have some time for some Q&A. Looks like we have a number of questions that have come in, uh, in today. So first one, Says, is there any way to do indexing of grains simultaneously during the measurements? That's a good question. Um, not easily. So you have to have the um, reconstructed volume 
to index the grains. And the only reason why I said it, um, not really, or it's, we're not quite there, is that it's kind of possible, um, probably doesn't work very well, meaning you can do uh, real-time reconstruction by using the limited projections to get kind of limited volume uh, reconstruction. And you can start indexing them, but indexing those grains is not an easy analysis. So you might not get really good results until the scan finishes and get a high quality reconstructed volume. I know this is not a clear yes and no answer, but technically uh, mm -hmm. you can kind of do it, but we probably want to wait a little more to see better algorithm or better uh, scans. So I guess you're saying theoretically possible, but probably practically difficult. Yeah, well said, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, uh, next one, I'm gonna translate this in a little bit. Uh, I think the question is getting at, uh, you know, which of the Rogaku machines are, are possible of using the uh, machine learning capabilities that you, uh, that you went through? Uh, all of them. Because in the machine learning or deep learning, a part of the analysis, I'm using Dragonfly. And Dragonfly can uh, load CT scans from any of the Rigaku systems. So you can use any systems, you know, any three of them, and can use machine learning to the results. Okay. Next one, uh, is it possible to run a sample that is larger than the FOV? For example, a core or a whole rock, and if so, what are the negative effects of uh, Yes, you that? can. Um, so the field of view and the sample size do not need to be the same, and sample size can be larger. Um, the consequences are, um, generally speaking, you will see a higher noise level when the field of view is smaller than the sample. And you probably don't want to go to like a one-tenth of the sample size, but if you're like a half or two thirds, uh, you should be able to do a scan. Again, it might take a little bit longer to get the same data quality because of the noise level. Okay, um, next one. Want to know if there is a software avail available that can calculate interaction energy during void space calculations or volume percentages? I guess you have to define uh, what kind of energy interaction you want to calculate, but you can always export the poor network analysis of results and feed that to whatever uh, program you can use to calculate the energy. Mm -hmm. In the same manner, you know, uh, it's very common to export the CT analysis of results as um, the tetrahedral mesh and people feed that to final element analysis program. So. That analysis probably is not done in the CT analysis program, but you can export the results and move on to a different program to do that kind of calculation. Okay, uh, here's an easy one. How do you mount the uh, drill cores on the sample stage? Okay, that is an easy one. Um, if it's a relatively large core and um, let's say like one or two inches in diameter and the bottom is flat, uh, you can just place it on the stage and you don't need to do anything more than that. If it's a little bit smaller or maybe the bottom is not flat, then you can use a clay, wax, or double-sided tape to secure it. Okay. So this, so uh, we have one more, actually, this is kind of a, uh, this is a long question, kind of a comment as well. So I'm going to read it as it is. It says, what can you suggest for identifying porosity in shales using CT? I have performed certain experiments, but identifying porosity in shale was much harder than that of sandstones. Is using high energy X-ray source like a synchrotron the only option? Or would phase enhanced methods be able to work uh, possibly with a, uh, a lab scale micro CT? Okay. Um, so it is true that probably the porosity analysis or any phase analysis of shale using X-ray CT is uh, more challenging. And the reason um, usually is the resolution. The pores in the shale are a lot smaller than what you see in like a sandstone or um, carbonate. So 
it depends on the typical size of the sample you're trying to analyze, but it, assuming that you can make it very small, um, what you need is a higher resolution. You want to make smaller sample, you know, thin core and use higher resolution. And you can do that with um, CT scanners that have lenses for parallel beam geometry. You don't necessarily need to go to higher energy because the sample is small. But um, just compared to SCM, X-ray CT, you know, in general has lower resolution and that's probably what is making it more difficult. But you wanna go for higher resolution to do it better. Okay. So we have uh, one question and a follow-up here. So the first question is, why are the poor connections, I guess in, in, in one of the displays that you showed, shown as straight lines? And then his follow-up questions are, he's referring to the throats, and can you obtain curved throat connections? Uh, yes, for the curved uh, throat connections. I think we showed both of them, but, um, the line between two pores can be either straight or kind of round around the way going through the actual void space. And those are just different representations and you can choose which one to use or analyze or display. Okay. Then we have, um, so are you saying that you can differentiate between oil, brine, CO2, and air bubbles without having to add something like iodine? to differentiate them? Uh, not exactly. So let me clarify what I meant. Um, so the sample we used um, for the last example, the solid part is mostly quartz, I believe. That's the sand grain. Um, and the brine is not, I guess I have to define what brine is. That brine is a stain x-ray wise. It has iodine in it. That's why uh, brine can be differentiated from oil and air in this case. So it's air, oil, um, iodine stain brine, and SiO2, or the phases. And you can change the level of uh, staining depending on what you're dif you know, trying to differentiate the brine from. So that's an adjustable parameter. Okay. Well, looks like that's all we're gonna be able to have time for today. But again, we do have all the questions saved. And we'll do our best to get back to all shortly with answers to the questions we didn't get to. And as I said earlier, recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow. And the email will go out to all registrants with instructions how to view the recorded presentation. Uh, lastly, after the close of the webinar today, you'll automatically be directed to a landing page on the Regaku website with a link to our next webcast on life science applications. We hope you can tune in for that one as well. And thanks to everyone for attending. I will also uh, echo Aya's thoughts on the Regaku X-ray Convention. Um, you can certainly just Google that, Regaku X-ray Convention, and uh, you'll get to our landing page and uh, perhaps we can see you there as well. Okay, well, we hope to see you back soon. Thanks a lot and bye-bye.